Okay, so. Mystery of the veil, beneath the veil, around the clock tower. Can you hear me well? Yes. yes. Okay, long forgotten memories are reawakened from dormancy. The context. So I have talked, talking about this before, which is um, what is this world? Why I'm doing this? A little bit of context, just because I want people to understand and you guys to understand. Um, before I get into the world building based on this world, I want to understand why I'm doing this and the intention behind it. So this uh, city is called Tripoli and I really love the city. It, it's not uh, a place I was born or raised in, it's just a place I visited in my country and I fell in love with it. But when you Google this um, city, mostly you get like some, uh, you know, like negative, uh, you know, just news and because it was the last city in Lebanon to end the civil war, which was not really um, far away ago. And it's usually a very prob problematic city and it, people don't allow like their children or their like teenage, you know, to go visit it just like they would visit uh, other places in Lebanon such as Jbeil or, you know, different places, although it has beautiful heritage. So Tripoli is one of those cities that preserve their ancient medieval character. Every nook and cranny, every street and alley, every place of worship is redolent with nostalgia. There are bazaars known here as souks, um, with places for every craft, the souk for tailors, jewelers, copper beaters, soap makers, and carpenters, to mention a few. So again, uh, just for me, I, want, I wanted to start this whole like project and presentation um, as with my intention that this whole project uh, going even beyond just this workshop is a love letter for this beautiful city that touched my heart. And I'm building upon um, my graduation project that was recently won uh, Tamayo's award, which is an international award over like 500 projects from 41 countries in the whole world applied and I got to the top seven. Um, so it's, it was also, I'm not going to talk about this project right now, but it's, it's, a, it's a craft center and documentation center that talks about like the heritage of crafts and goes in detail and try to implement new technologies to preserve those crafts. And of course, um, this is a structure, this is a building. And my question was when I started this like journey is how can architecture be a power, uh, a sort um, you know, of, um, a force of, uh, like economical empowerment and heritage preservation. And I changed this question to other things now, more than architecture. So most of the time, this is how we experience a place story. So my question became, how can we experience this rich urban fabric, societal dynamics and complex history of heritage sites through interactive and enlightening narrative? And I changed this approach of thinking only about architecture in terms of buildings and material to thinking about architecture in terms of virtual spaces. So this is going to be like the core of my project, a new way to experience cultural heritage using immersive experiences. So immersive technology makes the intangible, um, such as cultural heritage, tradition, myth, narrative, urban, um, you know, like uh, stories, everything. They, it makes them tangible. It enables us to see what has been and what could be. My project proposes ways where digital archiving could, could, take in, uh, could be taken to the next level with the help of this emerging new technology such as, a, such as immersive technology, blockchain, and data storytelling. For the sake of this workshop, I tied up these virtual worlds that I am creating into one like overarching narrative, but this doesn't have to be um, how we can experience these worlds. So I used a narrative to go from one place to another, but they can work as a standalone experiences in this open source world. And the best part is you are a part of the story. So it's not only you reading or you like going and reading about these people or experiencing these people at the museum, you are actually immersed in the story and you have an active part in it. So it's basically just gamifying this um, whole approach to, um, you know, archiving and documentary centers. 
So the story summary. So I'm not going to go in detail in the narrative because I want to explain like the world building. Um, but here's the story. And let me know if you can hear the audio, please, please, please. The Mystery of the Veil is an open source world exploration game inspired by the... Can you hear the audio? Yes, it's clear. Yes, very well. Cool. Rich heritage of the Lebanese city of Tripoli. In this universe, one story involves a girl who receives an unusual gift. A clock watch that opens to reveal a secret augmented map. Tripoli is at war. So the girl travels carefully to the city to solve this mystery. She embarks on an enthralling journey through interwined timelines, jumbled realities, and numerous missions to complete. Her augmented cityscape adventure takes her from one portal to another. Realities collide as she encounters digital ghosts from the past, learning a lot about the city and herself along the way. She progresses deeper and deeper into the digital reality after passing through five distinct portals and completing the quests until she reaches the realm of the veil. The land is shrouded from the horizon which hints at what might be beyond. The clock tower and the spirits she encountered in the city are all there, dormant and blanketed in sand. She penetrates the light beam and the veil falls gracefully. She finds herself in another virtual land, the luminous ground, a place where luscious trees carry the wisdoms of humankind manifested as floating shimmering pomegranates. She finally meets her mother, whom she had been looking forward to seeing after learning about her through her missions and journey in this world. Her mother, an AI digital clone discloses many mysteries and memories from her childhood and explains why she can't remember her true origins. Okay, so Mystery of the Veil, of the Veil. Where am I? Also let me know if you can hear the audio. Okay, so this is <laughs> a twist <laughs> before the, I just made this before the presentation because I think that it needs to be done uh, for people to understand what the worlds are. So on the top of um, this like uh, diagram uh, is post-war Tripoli, which is the reality or the overworld that she starts with. 
And then we have augmented reality, which is the gift, which is the clock watch that is the key to enter this um, loop of you know, virtual worlds. And then we have mixed reality, which is something I'm going to explain at the end, the technology, uh, which is like the place where the portals happen. And then we have, uh, she goes deeper and deeper into this digital world. She reaches um, like purely virtual world, which is the realm of the veil, uh, where you see the clock tower and the sand and the veil. And then she goes into something called um, hyper virtual reality, where this scene is affected, which is the luminous ground, um, the scene with the pomegranate. And this scene is affected by the way she's thinking and she's feeling and it's interacting with her. Now let's talk about um, the portals, which are basically pockets of collective memory, as I like to call them. Um, so we, her journey starts, of course, at this place, El Tel Clock Tower, and she goes through the city, through the souks, to start um, going from one portal to another. So first of all, we have um, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, four, and five, until at last she's, she has the key to unlock and reach um, the realm of the veil. Um, so this is just, each portal has um, a type of cultural heritage that it's trying to embody, a physical setting that it's locked to, a mixed reality setting, a lead character that she interacts with, some kind of digital artifact that she has to give or interact with in order to unlock a digital artifact that she has to take so she can unlock the next portal. And there's a plot that happens that's also based in the heritage that um, this, this portal is embodying. So for the sake of this presentation, I'm just gonna talk about only one portal because I tried to talk about more than one um, and it's, you know, any, it, they need more development. So I have one portal, which is the second portal, the Abu Ali River that we're gonna talk about. And it's talk about, here I write cultural heritage type, it's natural habitat, but it's gonna be more than that. It's the, the ecological relationship of the people that live around, um, you know, a river in the city. So let's jump right into it, Abu Ali River. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the historical geographical framework. Uh, the city of Tripoli is divided into two nuclei. One represents the port area, which is by the sea. And then we have uh, deeper into the city, the old city, which is, um, you know, like cut in half um, with this passing river that used to really be flowing in the old city, just like Venice. So the Abu Ali River, which is a natural given interwoven in the basis of the city's growth and development, as well as a culture and livelihood of the population, uh, became the core of Tripoli. A deeper look into the map of old Tripoli with its building, residence, markets, mosques, inns, roads, shops, and gates revealed the majority of these structures were constructed along this riverbank. So it was really, really populated around this uh, riverbank. And this is something that I also incorporated in my concept. So the river and its ecological interaction, uh, interaction. Starting from the, it's a, it's, a, it's a building in the east, the river travels semi-straightly for 820 meters and it's pretty long. And yes, just skipping through those, the most important areas of Tripoli's urban core are both banks. So like the left side and the right side of the uh, river. Housing units were built in the riverbed on both sides. The ground level, which is frequently in the form of arches, is either a residential building or a warehouse. And usually it's um, left, so they don't live in the ground level, which touches the river, because sometimes it floods or the you know water level rises, and they just allow this river to come into their houses, and they live in the upper floors. The river and, the, and, and its ecological interaction, uh, continuing on the one I said before, that in the, the manifestations of this ecological interaction, uh, we will later, we will see later in a more accurate, detailed manner and at different levels from the use of like drinking water, the management of um, flour mills and uh, tannery, not tanning, tannery, butchery, places of residence, play, work and overlap with customs, traditions and beliefs. Um, of the river and community in Tripoli. So tannery, slaughterhouses, and the butcher's bridge. Tannery, slaughterhouses, and the butcher market are three occupations that intersect and are linked to the river community. Okay, each requires river water in a different way. 
um, and it is mostly needed uh, for the nether tanning, whereas the butcher's market and the slaughterhouses use it um, not in the creation of their craft, but just as a drain for the leftovers and waste. The tanners used to have their own cafe also along with the mosque, and they used to pray there. So they created their own structures that served them as like for their specific occupation. So there's a lot of myths and customs and belief. I'm not going to go through all of them, but something I really um, hear a lot, even from the people, and some people truly believe in this, that the castle nearby the river is, um, you know, there's a serpent or like a big snake that lives in there. And there's nothing more un animously, I don't know, agreed upon by the people of the old city, such that their um, unanim sorry, anonymity of the narration of the legend of the castle, the serpent, and the river. It was mentioned in the history of Tripoli as follows, that um, they confirmed that there's a huge snake extending its head from the top of the castle, and it forms an arch just to drink from the water of Ab uh, Abu Ali River, and then it goes back and hides in the castle. So another um, really interesting um, myth or like beliefs or costume that the people used to do is the ritual river dumps. And this one is my favorite. It was popular to throw or discharge special things in the Abu Ali River, including the umbilical cord after giving birth. Um, the umbilical cord was placed in a bag of cloth and then weighted um, with stones and then thrown into the river, not within the reach of a cat or a dog, so they can like not you know, eat it, and then, um, which may cause the man's offspring to be cut off or cursed if like a cat or dog was able to get it. So that's why they put stones in it and they go like, they throw it deep into the river. Um, they also, uh, the denture of the dead and the cloth that cannot be washed, also thrown in the river. The boy's first haircut, which can be collected and the, at the barber, weighted and valued, and its weights distributed in gold for the needy, and then the hair is thrown into the river. Uh, the boy's hair is placed in a silk cloth and scattered in the river. Uh, there's also something that, you know, we Muslim do, which is um, you remove like the top part of the penis and it's also um, thrown in the river. So. This is only some of the things that people used to throw in the river for blessings or something. Floods uh, of Abu Ali River. So, yeah. Now we go to uh, a second section of the history of Abu Ali River, which is the floods. So there's a lot of floods that happened, but the most drastic one is the one I'm going to talk about right now, which is the last one that happened. Um, yeah. On the evening of December 17, 1955, Tripoli was devastated by a flood which killed scores of men, women, children. In the face of high water pressure, some um, barrages failed and the water rushed in, sweeping away the trees, wooden houses in its path. So the trees, so the tree trunks, um, you know, they were swept with the river flood and it blocked some like dams or something along the river and the water started accumulating and it really flooded uh, the area and it was a you know, a really devastating event because like people, like there was um, bodies, the water turned to red because of the, the, the you know, the, the dead bodies. Uh, even like it was like sweeping away uh, shops and people swam to the roofs. So because the souks are so like, you know, populated and porous, like water went all through the souks and people had to swim in the, uh, in the streets just to reach the roof. And like more than 60 homes and 500 shops were destroyed uh, with over like 120 people killed. And by the way, the water, the waves, even the dark red color of the water reached um, parts of Syria. So that's like uh, really far. So what happened after this disaster? Um, in the wake of civil strife of 1958, the Lebanese government carried out something called the Abu Ali River Project, which required building a road 60 meter wide along with the course of the river. As a result of this project, um, all the buildings that were on the riverbed, um, they are called Abi Samra and Kibbe, hills overlooking the river or were raised, which ruined the beautiful and, uh, you know, like uh, terrain of the, and morphology of the land. And uh, yeah, in addition to that, the project saw destruction of entire souks and neighborhood located far away from the course of the river, uh, such as Nahasin. So it's a, it's a souk that's close to the river, but you know, they just eradicated as well. 
And at the time, it was said that the flood was exploited by some in order to build roads and prevent any protests, because like at the time there was like some protest happening. And this, this way they were able to control the city by, you know, um, eradicating uh, what we call like maybe the, the vein of the city. And even those dozens of archaeological and heritage sites, um, you know, professionals and like urbanists tried to protest against this plan. Um, you know, everything was destroyed in the process and some of the parts of the old city as well. So along the river route, the government widened the river instead of like um, widening only at the end, they widened, they widened the whole canal. They shut people off from the river, ruined the city's main ecological feature and with it, the people's relationship with the river. They built large streets across the old city, depriving many artisanal families and their shops and destroying Tripoli's culture and social aspects. Not only the artists, but also different souks such as farmer's market, the butcher's market that I told you about that used to happen, the fisher's market, everything was destroyed. And there were so many people were left jobless. And as a result, also like economic aspects were also um, affected and lost. So in conclusion, we have like a pre-flood Abu Ali River, then the flood happened, and then we have the, the post-flood and the canalization of the river. So what I wanted to create from this project is something that people can experience, of course, as a virtual experience that I want people to experience the whole story of the river in one setting. And so I thought of what if, so the flower mills is something I'm gonna talk about now more. It was something that was really giving um, this whole area um, like uh, certain, like it was really important, the flower mills. I'm gonna talk about it later. So I said like, maybe I can build this structure of having 12 or like the real number actually is eight eight uh, structures of flower mills above each other and then have like um like branches of uh, bread connected to each house in the city and this is the sketch uh, that i came up with so it's uh, i'm gonna talk about more about each unit and how it's all connected to each other and it's connected to the river at the base and why i chose to go like very much vertically and have this like connection like veins that connected to the city. Um, but before that, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the modeling of this uh, project. Uh, so I went into the city, I tried to took as much as possible uh, pictures from the old buildings that are, you know, like still on the riverbanks, some of them, and try to come up with my own like UV maps, uh, like just, you know, puzzling out, um, you know, like each facade and then adding it to Blender and then like modeling uh, this uh, structure that I created in, you know, UV3 using UV maps. So having all these blocks, I have like a folder for each UV map. And then I used um, some certain like architectural elements and facades that I found from pictures and from pictures that I actually took, not only from the internet. And then um, I modeled this structure right here. Okay, so I should probably have said that before, but the concept of what I'm trying to do is um, having the river mills um, on top of each other. Because like Tripoli was, um, you know, when you go to Tripoli, the thing that people talk about the most is the sweets and the cuisine and the food. And I, when I read about uh, Abu Ali River and how they were like uh, eight different um, flour mills, which we can see right here, also one of it. Um, it was a, a core reason why um, this, the sweets is such a big thing in Tripoli because there were so much flour mills and they used to make special flour for sweets. And that's how like the cuisine uh, developed. So Tripoli was renowned as a river community with water mill system that was distinguished and expanded. Um, the number climbed, so it, the first there were five and then the number climbed towards eight mills. Tripoli mills included an extension in their original main work of secreting only like blood, uh, sorry, bread and flour for ovens and home, in addition to the ability to capture water. And special types of sweet flour were offered by the mills for the river uh, community. In addition, uh, for the grinding, the various types of grains, such as pepper, spices, cumin, uh, thyme, ses um, sesame, and more. Each form of sweets and, it, uh, and it, 
each form of sweet has its own flower. And like each mill was specialized with like a certain form of special flower for this special sweet. So like the local market, of course, it was you know booming with these, um, you know, like flower innovations. And, um, you know, the market uh, expanded and exported even to neighboring markets. So like um, not only in Lebanon, but also in Syrian cities. So Tripoli's min, uh, mills were open all year with an exception of summer due to the water scarcity and heavy winter days to accommodate this rising demand for flower workers worked day and night, even on holidays. And the millstone was altered from time to time uh, in order to, uh, you know, accommodate for the, uh, you know, softness or the, uh, you know, how, what I was saying, sorry, I'm tired. <laughs> Generated soft light, beautiful noises for the children uh, to go to sleep at night, I don't know. So um, the way I went with this uh, structure vertically, because I wanted to try um, to metaphorically, you know, uh, talk about this separation or this detachment from the river. So as a start, this bridge right here, I tried to create one just, um, similar to it at the base when you're connected to the river and as you go up you will experience um, the history of Tripoli and the river community um, as you go further and further more towards the current situation which is on top and then inside these rooms maybe you can read about like what happened in Tripoli the floods in, in the middle and then like on the top where you can see like the river really far away from you and you feel detached from it, you can, you know, learn about the current situation of, um, of the river. So as you go up further, you're disconnected from the river as if the events of time can be ex experienced vertically through the structure's uh, symbolic floors. And of course, each floor presents an opportunity to further explore the river's history. So they don't have to be rooms. It's, as I, as I said, it's like a virtual, um, you know, uh, structure. So each room can be like a video, an immersive experience. It's just like a symbolic uh, structure of like the 12 flower mills as they were, uh, like spread out horizontally along the river. So I put them like stack them vertically for us to experience them in one place. And this is a little like render of uh, the structure in place. And it's glitching a little bit because like each of these um, ropes that are connected to the houses are like strings of memory and people are forgetting about the river, forgetting about the flower mills, forgetting about the cuisine of Tripoli that's so very much known for its sweets, forgetting about all this, you know, like history that happened and like how the river was so important to this city. And that's why the building is suffering, it's glitching. And, you know, back to the narrative of our little protagonist here, uh, as I said, these structures can be like, this whole world can be experienced without the story that I'm trying to tell uh, as a standalone um, experience. But for the sake of, of course, this workshop and like the story that I'm trying to say, we have a protagonist and she has to do something. So the narrative here is that, somehow the bread isn't going into the houses and there's no, not enough water. And like this, this building should be, um, you know, flooding with water vertically. Uh, it's, so the water comes from, like it's a magical water that is not floating from the river through the vertical mids, uh, mills upward. So the water comes down and then it floats upward uh, into the structure. Of course, this is just like virtual water. Something is stuck at the base level and she has to figure out what's happening. Um, and the story is that, uh, you know, in Tripoli, two people died uh, out of conflict with each other and like the uh, Syrian regime, something like that. They were like, they found two bodies uh, in the river. So these two bodies are, um, you know, uh, metaphorically um, presented as like two fish that got stuck in the mill and she has to, uh, you know, take them out. And they're, you know, rotten. They're uh, just like gives, it's like, you know, like it's like the corruption when we fight between each other, we give uh, we give away for what could have been um, a great, you know, um, you know, more like economic empowerment, more uh, more like stable. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm so tired. <laughs> so now on to the virtual lands. We've got the realm of the veil. 
Um, so we start with this clock tower that I showed you before. The clock, the clock kept working all through the First World War and the Second World War, and then it stopped only when the Civil War happened in Lebanon in the 70s. Now, in 2016, the clock tower was rehabilitated and it went back to working again. Uh, when she encounters the clock tower, she, uh, she noticed that it's actually stopped working because uh, the time that she came to Tripoli, which is 2030, there was a war. So the clock tower was a gift to Tripoli, by the way, from uh, Sultan Abdel Hamid, which is an Ottoman uh, Sultan. And he gifted this uh, tower to Tripoli. And this is why I think it's also something that, uh, an element that her mother took from the city and gifted her as a key to get into these um, virtual worlds. So, why the veil? Uh, there's a veil around this um, realm of the veil, and then it has to, um, so the veil is obscures, that is its nature. The idea of the veil, I, it, it, so I wanted to do an idea of the veil, but then when I'm reading more about it, uh, I found that it has roots in ancient storytelling. So if you know, like the shroud of Anubis, which he used to get from one realm of the dead to another. So he shroud himself and then go, and it allowed him to go from one realm to another. So it could be like a physical metaphor for separations between realms. And these dormant spirits are covered with sand of time, like travelers around the clock tower. So before like the clock tower, before like having a city around it, it was really just the clock tower. And then uh, people start using it as like a taxi or like horses, sorry, horses stop. So it's like they're still waiting, they're stuck, their memory is stuck. And, or maybe like lost soul in the desert where they take comfort in each other around the campfire. Now into the light toward the luminous ground, she goes where long hidden secrets reveal themselves to those who wander. And it's just a blunder fire. <laughs> and here is the luminous ground that we previously saw. Um, it's basically, it's a very interesting concept because the luminous ground is based on two concepts that I created. So as I said, I'm not focusing on just creating architecture. I want to experience cultural heritage in a way that's different than just like physical buildings or even like virtual buildings. So the idea of uh, lush, luscious trees was something that Tripoli used to have. And that's why they call it, they call Tripoli al fayha which is the city with beautiful smell because it had so much luscious trees and it was like um, fed by the river. So yeah, it was always, um, you know, it had a beautiful smell to it and people can smell it even like from outside the city. So that concept of having a luscious land was of course something that I was, uh, wanted to implement. Mm -hmm. And very early on, I wanted to create something um, called like uploading the wisdom of humankind into each and every pomegranate. So when you touch the pomegranate, uh, you will hear maybe a, a beautiful quote or a verse or a religious saying or something like that. So each and every pomegranate is something that someone uploaded to the cloud and created, um, you know, uh, just like contributed to documenting this like universal wisdom. And uh, the world luminous ground, actually it's a, it comes from a fourth book of the nature of order. I'm not gonna read the whole paragraph, um, but it's by someone called Alexander. I don't know what's his rest of the name, um, but he talks about a luminous ground and it's a, he's actually an urbanist. So it's a, it's a, it's a, there are a series of books around urbanism and city buildings and neighborhoods and things like that. But what I really like is that uh, he tried to think about not cutting your um, physiological, ph physiological self from your spiritual self and trying to think about building things in a way that it's also emotional uh, and uh, spiritual as well as uh, functional. So you can read more about that and it's very, very beautiful uh, uh, piece of work. And something about the luminous ground also is that, as I said, it's like hyper VR, which is, it gets affected by your mood. So the fog inside the, the area is affected by what you're thinking, what you're feeling. If you're scared, maybe it goes more blue, like it, it interacts with your brain waves. Now the technology, everything that I said is based on real research and not really sci-fi things that are happening right now with the apps that are out there right now. So first of all, Worm Tech, 
the key principle behind worm technology is that it doesn't aim to replace our most basic human needs, such as contact with loved ones or feeling belonging. And in this case, it could help you like overcome a certain loss by like, um, you know, interacting for this person for the last time or something like that, which is what the mother did by creating a digital clone of herself to interact with her um, daughter. And she was able to tell her things that maybe she wasn't able to do in real life. Um, the other thing that I talk about also is mixed realities. So built on these two realities, um, mixed reality apps allow you to manipulate and interact with elements from both the real world or the digital world. So it's not VR, it's not augmented like on top of your real world. It's something that you can play around between the real world and the virtual world. And you can even edit your, um, your real life, uh, you know, just scenery. And then we have the very hip word that I was speaking about before Meta, uh, you know, launched, not launched, changed his name. So Metaverse and Virtual Land. For example, here is a picture from a virtual, um, you know, land called, it's not virtual land, it's like a place where you can buy uh, lands, which is called Decentraland, a 3D virtual world platform where users could buy virtual plots of land as NFTs uh, using uh, cryptocurrency. So I imagine like having voluminous grounds and place like this, maybe people can visit it. So it's something that's open, something that people, all people can contribute towards. It's not only like a 3D space, it's a virtual uh, land in the, in op, on Web3. So of course, something that I was talking about before a lot in the, my previous presentation, uh, but I decided to just tone it down for now because it needs a lot of work and it's a bit complex, which is the metaverse tele teleportation. Space Popular proposed a civic infrastructure for virtual te teleportation, which I use by the way with the veil, uh, the fabric. And between like going from one portal to another, also you use this type of fabric, but I also didn't mention it not right now. It, needs more um, detail and like research, but they propose portals made of virtual textiles. So I have a Oculus and when I shift between like one app or when an app like doesn't load properly, I'm left in blackness. So just, it, it it's not like the phone. You cannot like just directly jump into a different world. You need something to ease your way. And having this like tactile experience of, you know, moving, this fabric and going into another place is really something that I'm looking forward to if it really happened. And I wanted to implement in my world. And of course there is haptic tech, uh, which is just you being able to experience uh, immersive uh, worlds more than with just your eyesight. And the last one, which is something I really love, which is data storytelling. Uh, this is a video from an um, application called Helium, which you can now also download on Oculus Quest 2, uh, which also uh, works with your brain waves to um, render scenery according to what you're feeling. And you know it helps you improve your performance and fight stress and all that. Just like basically calm up what's in the metaverse. And of course there's digital clones, which they know don't have to be like human bodies. The idea behind it is having like an audiovisual memory, personality, or customer behavior cloning. Um, in creation digital clone, they create a digital version of whatever like, that is non-digital or even digital. And it could be like a fake image, an avatar, fake video, and, and or the sound of a person, um, things like that. So it's also something that I based my story upon. And that is it. See you in the luminous ground. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Great job. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. I really like the video illustrations. I think it uh, certainly helps with um, presenting all the feel that, uh, that you're trying to achieve. And I think that's it's really good. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, I, 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 I wanted to be more articulate, but because I've been like two, two nights, I haven't slept. So that's why the words were like slipping. So <laughs> it's okay. It's really cool. This ends it well. Are you happy? Are you happy about the results? I'm happy 
I would love if I was able to create the portal in real time, real time augmented reality, but I, I've learned how to do it. But the problem is that um, using Adobe Arrow, I need like some kind of like Apple uh, hardware to use Adobe Arrow and like have the portal like in real time footage. So I'm still trying to figure this out. I wanted to use it in this one. And I also found a way to merge, like I've, this, for this, for this project, I wanted to experiment more than like just produce uh, work that I know how to do. So for example, these 3D movies, CGI, all these things, I've never worked in 3D. I visually am really good in 2D, like Photoshop, just photo collage and things like that. So for this workshop, I said, you know what, I'm gonna do 3D. So I sat down, learned, learned Blender, learned how to do movie editing. Um, I also tried to do this like uh, VR situation in Blender, um, augmented reality. Like I really pushed myself. So I'm I'm happy with this experimentation. I think really? I think I I think it's really good, and it, it definitely comes across that um, you're experimenting with all of these things. Uh, one comment I would say is don't forget to also play into your own strengths. Um, mm. I completely buy that you know what you're doing with this project, um, but it, as a, as someone who hasn't seen the project in a very long time, um, it would be great if you had some form of um, simple either atlas or archive that would help me navigate it um, because mm. you have so many facets to this wonderful project so many narratives um, so many moments where you as a designer are touching upon different agencies as an architect uh, or rather as a spatial practitioner um, that having something as simple as um, a small icon with mm. an object a title and a two or three line description to help me navigate all of these moments, wonderful moments, objects, stories, lineages, heritages, places, would just really help me navigate it. Yes, um, yes. Yeah, because I can see you're having a wonderful time experimenting. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that? Like, what would, what would you like to see? Yeah. yeah. I can you, give you, up on Alan's yes. idea. I was thinking about that as well. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just go for it. I think that is really great. Like. We, we can really see the passion, right? How you enjoy the, um, with the project and then you, you have produced results, solid results from your exper experimentation, not just experiments for the sake of experiment, experimenting with the software. So I think what Alan's saying that I, I was thinking about that as well. So maybe it's the presentation or maybe it's, mm. um, it's the methodology, right? It's like how you select those events. How do you select those spaces in the city? Is that... Would it be better if you have a timeline, you know, like curating all the important events to your research? Uh, maybe is a more strategic selection of spaces or camera mm -hmm. angles. Like how, how you, because, I mean, it's great that you, you, you show us a lot of these pockets in the city, but in a way, I also wonder, like, how did you make those decisions? Why did you select the, this, this market? Is that why? How 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 is that? Perhaps it's like in part of the uh, the other chapters in in your overall world building. But maybe the the presentation we saw today is sort of require a bit of a structure or yeah. a, a, an idea just to show your audience how you make those very careful decision or selection of events and spaces. Um. True. Also, uh, something that I've done uh, in like my own like sketches and things like that is map like the history of the river according to seasons and according to time, and then like have this um, whole like uh, like elements in this like whole map. But like downwards is the seasons. So every time every time the river changes season, there's something. Uh, there's an activity that's happening. And with the community, so the mm. mills are working. They are shutting. Uh, there's, they are, people are taking bath in the river. They're not. Children are playing. They're not. There's uh, celebrations, holidays. Uh, there's not. So it's according to the season. Um, and people were very affected by the river and the season, and they used to live by that. And then there's also the time, which is like be way before the the. Uh, sorry, the canal, the concrete canal, and then, and, and, you know, after the flood or just before the flood, and then after the flood right now, how they're living. I love this kind of work, this like strategic considerations, like 
Uh, but I didn't do it because I didn't have the time. So yeah, yeah. Marina, can I can I see you have a page on in your slide where you had a bunch? It was what you this used. One? Uh, yes, there's that one, but it was slightly further. It was when you were talking about the mills. You had all of the textures that you then applied to oh, your okay. design. Oh, the UV maps. Yes, the UV yeah. maps. Yeah. Because okay. I think I can, I think I might be able to explain my thought a bit better here. Yeah, yeah. here we go. So there's this in one. My, this one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So in my mind, if, because you talk about, and I'm just going to try to list as many as the ones that I can remember. Um, you have all of the characters. I remember the, the, the girl, the fisherman, you had uh, the water bottle, the pomegranate, the veil, the tree, um, the mill, the river, uh, Tripoli. Mm. Um, you also had five dimensions, if I'm not mistaken. One, two, yes. a mixed reality, three, four, five. Yes, you had five dimensions. So if you gave someone like myself who hasn't seen the project for, you know, say before, an archive that had a one inch by one inch um, image or, you know, mm. 2D, sim very simple 2D drawing with a name, a title, maybe a tag or a series of tags that say um, the water bottle is... Uh, tagged to the fisherman and a location and I don't know a particular moment in time you would mm -hmm. then start to slowly build up this giant archive of all of the things that you as a designer and this is what David was saying have chosen specifically to focus on because someone else might come along to Tripoli and say actually I have different objects I want to talk about but at very least through this archive that potentially you could curate um, mm. you'd be able to keep a track of all of the experimentation that you're doing, which is what I think um, David and I are encouraging you to do. Keep experimenting, it's great. We know, where, we know that it will lead somewhere um, incredibly interesting, but just so that you don't lose track of your own uh, creativity, play to your strengths, keep the archiving process going so that when you get to um, a moment like the mills, um, you can explicitly say that we're on this level of the five mm. levels, we're in this character, these are the objects at play, and this is how it's panning out. Yeah, I think, I think that that's a great idea. It's like archiving. That really, that, that can help you, that, that can really help you to structure the research. Uh, I mean, the, using Abu Ali River as the device to connect across time, events and mm -hmm. the um, urban lives that was a really smart decision mm. uh, now it's really like if you could you could be more articulate or more deliberate with the uh, the archive or the other uh, archiving as an action then it will be really really great like making mm. it really accessible even though this is quite a com complex like a uh, research or like a series of operations. And it, it's, Marina, it's, it's quite, it's quite nuanced as well, because yeah, yeah. The, sto the stories that you're telling, your project is in effect already archiving, but because the thing that you're trying to archive is so large, the process of archiving needs a system. Okay. <laughs> and we just, we just, we just happen to have told you to archive. And there might be another way that you potentially could go about doing it, but, um, yes, it's, it, it's to keep track of your own design progress. To, to you know, I, is there like some type of material that I can review, like some sources, resources? Uh, yeah, I'll get you, I'll get you the link to the, I'm trying to remember it now. I'll, I'll get you a link in a minute. It's great. I think those are great su suggestions. And I think there's also one bit, uh, in this presentation that, um, didn't cover what you had before is yeah. the, um the the keys to each level so yeah. i think it could be um uh, like if you imagine this is like a video game where you are you are uh controlling an avatar and walking around in the space mm -hmm. and you have a bag uh, of infantry and then it could be also a collection of textiles and objects that lead you to other levels and mm -hmm. those could be the big categories to sort out this huge archive that Alan mentioned. That's great. I want to congratulate you on the production value. I think 
the voiceover and also like the 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 mini movie that you created, the luminous ground, and then you have these different voices from different um, coming from different direction. I think that works quite well. But perhaps I just want to make another note on that. Like I know, like the um, before walking to work towards the portal, that that space was great. You know, but after entering, I remember in the movie, is is black, is blank, is white. Right? Yeah. It's yeah. I don't know. Like maybe can you create that sense of arriving or entering this digital world differently? Maybe give、uh, a bit of attention to that. Yeah. Build it up. You know, like sure. I, I, yeah, it's difficult. Like how you how you. Yeah, how I love you, your. Comments because there are like they're solid. There are things that I thought about, but I didn't have the time to produce. So, for example, when she enters into this light, we're supposed to go from the other side, and then the veil has、um, landed. That's what I said in the story, and then she sees the ground. But also, like physics simulation, cloth falling, it took some time. So,、uh, but thank you for that. I'll fix the video. <laughs> it's not really fixing. It's just like. Keep pushing yeah, it. Yeah. Keep pushing it exactly. Yeah. I think it's really quite good. Yeah, I I really like this project, and I I see this uh, it's like a full on virtual space at the end. So I I I do think you can keep on working on different details and sorting out、um, the archive, and yeah, and slowly build up the space as well. Okay. In, Thank you, Ben. In an in an idealized world,、mm. you can create, you can turn it into an event or like a metaverse in your city, your country, and、uh, launch it, having、um, two, one that's physical space to show showcase the、um, the archive, and then another one a digital space where people、mm. can travel. Across time, time dimension, and other things. Yeah. So,、uh, and, web web two version and web three version. And then seeing how, seeing seeing how you propose for the two environment to interact. I think that is also like quite interesting. Like、right? people now, a lot of people are talking about metaverse, and then also the technology that involved the AR, VR, and VR thing. Right. This. It's quite interesting to see how maybe you can propose an idea how the two can interact, right? Yeah. yeah. I think there is also some references in the chat box that、uh, Herman and Alan sent in. Yeah. Yes.、Coping. Thank you, Alan. One second. I'm I'm sending you one more, but it's a, it's giant. Read this and read this when you have a moment. Okay. Oh wait, I don't think I can. I, I might have to send you the. Can you send me your email in the chat so yep, I can email、please. you this PDF? Because um, I can't copy and paste the whole body of text. Zoom. <laughs> this is, um, I yeah. This Go ahead, great.、David. Yeah, this is great, Alan. This is like, this is like um, a project that has all the dimensions. Like if this is. If Molly like、um, doing this project at the AA, I think this is、mm. like, quite good, right? Like formulating whole brief, and then you know, like the researching and a series of urban operations, and then also the、uh, the technical aspect of the project. Absolutely, completely like, agree, David. Yeah,、um, I do have. I have、Sorry. a question for you, Marina. Before before I close my commentary,、um, at the very end, there are. Because you're effectively you're working in real time, meaning the technologies that you're、um, experimenting with are being currently developed. Of the ones that you had shown,、um, warm tech, haptic,、um, VR, AR, all the ones that you mentioned, which is the one that you feel is the most promising to your project?、Mm. Yeah, I'm just checking them. I think the virtual lands.、Mm. 
yeah i think having virtual lands and and the idea behind them is not only like just to produce items there that have like nft but you know when you have a land you can really fill it with whatever you want and you can monetize this um these items maybe to even benefit the people in the real life so the craftsmen can have like a virtual shop on like this land and people can visit from all around the world and interact with like his you know digital clone or just like the crafts there and maybe have some, you know, have like um, a scanned real um, craft that he made and have like one copy of that on like Web3. Uh, and then they can they take it home in their virtual lands and he can actually get paid for that because, you know, like crafts are really slow. And even if startups are coming um, from all around and trying to, you know, make them happen, they're just, you know, really hard for them and they're very selective. So I think digitizing that, that and having this gig economy uh, happen to these people is something I'm really excited about. If that's your gut reaction, um, stick to it. Mm. Don't, be, don't be driven, don't be, don't be um, swayed too much by any other field because if you're working in real time, um, the most exciting things are gonna happen day to day. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Alan. Just one, just one last question. Last one, last question. Um, if you can discuss with us, I remember in the midterm or like uh, the last time we talk, your project took a more political tone to it. I think there was some kind of sentiment or resentment towards the uh, collective memory erasure in 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 your environment or in your country. I see like today your presentation or the project, you know, like really. Um, I would say like move a level up, you know, like not really adopting the political tone so much. But I wonder, like, can you discuss if you still find it effective in, in terms of preserving the collective memory, even without the political tone? Um, you know, I think the political tone is really just like the river, it's intertwined into our collective memory, uh, as especially as Japanese people. But I think maybe as a person, I started to, you know, move past that. And I think it's reflected in my presentation. Um, but just before the presentation, I also deleted some slides that were political. I said, like, you know what, they're just going to take time. And, you know, I don't think they added so much to the story. The story will be present with the archive, not me talking about why I'm doing this because of political situation. I think that's, uh, that's something I removed. Do you find it more productive as well? Yes, of course, and less stressful. <laughs> mm, interesting. Yeah, I see. I see. Like some sometimes, student projects get quite political. But I just found I, I, I as I come to um, feel like those projects are not very productive. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's good to have a strong foundation in the narrative and. Um, I think it's also as important to build upon them. So like your your take on the uh, on your views and how you could take that and change it into something that has a real in impact to the world. And I think what you've done here, it creates an experience for people to understand all the historical conflicts, but um, also quite subtle using quite a lot of uh, symbolism. So yeah. I think it's really, yeah, really good take on it. Thank you. Great. Um, so, can I go sleep? <laughs> <laughs> yes, very well done. And I'll just have to sleep. <laughs> if you're, not, you're not staying for uh, for the next presentation. <laughs> I'll, I'll try. I'll try, but probably not. Just an hour more. <laughs> Stay. Okay. okay. And thank you so much, guys, for your comments. I well done. Really, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Well, well done. And well thank done. you so much for your presentation. And my email, I sent it to Zoom. If anyone has like more uh, your resources or comments, please let me know. This is an ongoing project. Just sent project, you an email. So... Oh, thank you, Alan. Efficient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.